Hello, Eve. How are you today? Hi, how are you? Good, good. Thanks for joining me. Of course. Uh, thank you for joining me last week. Yeah, no, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. To, we, for anyone who wasn't watching, we did a um, happy hour last week where Emma and I joined Eve to talk about our experience with um, Fair Play, the book Fair Play and the card system to help uh, divide more fairly what's going on in the household. And that was a lot of fun. So great. Perfect. And so thanks so much for joining me. Um, so the reason I was hoping, you know, getting on a call and doing an interview is because a to, of course, thank you for the book fair play, which has been a tremendous uh, help in our household. And then also to ask a few questions uh, generally about your journey uh, to becoming an author. I have a massive amount of respect for anyone who writes a book. I think it's a huge undertaking. <laughs> and then also learn a little bit about that journey and then dive into maybe a little bit more of some of the concepts in fair play. And then a few people had questions. I put up the live that we were going to go live and said, Hey, what should I ask Eve? And I got a few interesting, uh, interesting questions there. They'll ask you as well. Great. Thank you. Love it. Um, perfect. And so one of the quick things that I remembered as I was um, getting ready was that you, uh, you weren't always, you know, you didn't always do what you do now in the sense that you, you, uh, I'm, one of the things I saw in your background is that you, were a phil a phil I don't know the title, but it was like yeah, philanthropy no. manager helping people in charities. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That my background, uh, given is actually I'm a family mediator, lawyer. Um, I worked for J.P. Morgan Private Bank, uh, then my own firm, and I'm a philanthropic advisor. And it's okay if nobody knows what that means. You just have to picture the HBO show Succession. So I don't know if you guys yeah. have it there in Canada, but that HBO show Succession has helped me a lot because I guess they have a lot of advisors for that family and it's very similar to the work I do. I work on succession planning um, and philanthropy and family business mediation. So I'll take a family that, you know, every time, you know, second son who's supposed to take over the business uh, speaks, you know, dad storms out of the room. And then, mm. you know, years, you know, a year later after we've worked together, that family, all three generations, you know, are communicating with grace and humor and generosity. Um, but it doesn't happen overnight, really. It happens because you create shared systems. I think people are so afraid of that word system. You know, <laughs> I, think, I mean, maybe not men as much. And so with Fair Play, I've learned I can talk very differently to men than I can to women. And I think men are actually less scared of that word system. But that's really what I do. And that's what I did for Fair Play as well. I. I create family systems and all systems mean really is, you know, accountability and trust in its nutshell, you know, where you sort of know your role. Um, you have explicitly defined expectations to do your work or where, whether it's in the home or in the business and there's some fairness and transparency. So that is, that's Very my cool. day job. And I still do that day job for, um, for, families that look like the HBO show succession. So you should feel bad for me. <laughs> oh, very cool. Well, so the funny thing is, so I mean, I don't know, we haven't talked that much, but I'm actually a CFP. Uh, my day right. job is financial planner. And one of my favorite things to do is to help people and charities figure out how to give more uh, wisely. And then there's a lot of um, statistics around, you know, a generation that worked really hard to build an empire. And then three generations later, it's all gone. Okay. and how philanthropic giving can really help change the help the family and help tons of other people and how how little there is out there on good advice around that topic so and that, it's a that, pretty and fascinating it's, subject yeah, it's correlated with family business success in my in my world um i'm hired typically with from you know the uh, philanthropy side first and then mm. i work very closely on the family business succession because they're tied. The way that you make decisions in your philanthropy is a great testing ground for how you can make decisions in your family business. And so actually anybody out there who's interested in sort of getting your kids more financially savvy, obviously talk to Galen, but more than that, you know, just, um, you know, I really recommend a donor advice fund starting to talk about giving because those are conversations that are easy, easier to have than with your family wealth, but they, they reap rewards. Absolutely. And so I think it's this perfect tie into the book Fair Play, because one of the things, so if, for anyone who doesn't know, 
you wrote a book called Fair Play, which the way that it worked in my household was Emma read it yes. and she was learning a lot about it. She handed it to me. I read it. And there you go. And um, it has a system of a card system where it's, it's a way to um, really um, divvy up what's going on in the household, especially when there's kids in a way that's much more fair. In our household, we had gotten way out of, I had gotten way out of balance and kind of defaulting Emma to do a lot of things and, or, or it was, we didn't know who was doing what, which day. And it was just a question, who's putting the kids down, who's making the meals, all those things. And what was really cool about Fair Play and how I think it actually ties into everything you do is that the, that book acted almost as a, as a, as a, as an impartial mediator in our house in the <laughs> sense that it wasn't, Emma telling me we needed to do anything. It wasn't someone coming in. I didn't feel, you know, threatened or anything. It was just like, I, I'm going to read this book. And I think it worked really wonderfully that way because it was just, like I said, like a disinterested sort of, so to speak, third party in the household, just holding up a mirror to what was going on. And I was really surprised at how much I saw myself in the anecdotes of, um, you know, the imbalance, which typically the imbalance is that the, the wife in, the, if in a, in a husband-wife relationship or in a partner relationship ends up in doing more. The, the woman typically by default ends up doing more. And since we've implemented the fair play system, it's helped divide it. And in our case, which I meant to mention, and mention in the uh, chat last week, but didn't, is um, I think our kids feel more calm too, because there's just more consistency. Like they know, you know, when we go back to taking our kids to school, which will happen at some point, um, they know who's taking them which day, they know who's putting them to bed, they know who's doing this. And there's just much less questioning in their minds of, oh, who's going to do this this time? It's very clear to them. And they've said it. They're like, oh, is today daddy's turn to make dinner? Is today, like, whose turn that. is it today? Yeah. Who's taking us to school tomorrow? Like, they, they look at the schedule and they're like, oh, okay, we know who's doing what. I really appreciate that. And I think, you know, this is, you know, I'll show you your listeners, your viewers, like basically these are the fair play cards. You know, you can download them. They come with the book or they, you know, once you read the book, I don't recommend just using the cards alone without the book because then it's just another list. You know, you're throwing cards at each other, it doesn't work. Um, but <laughs> if you understand what a system is and then you use the cards, what's so powerful about them and why, and this goes back to your CFP stuff, Galen, and so why do I love cards so much? It's exactly what you said. And hopefully you'll tag me on this in the story so I can save this conversation because I want to use oh, the documentary that we're doing. Um, yeah, yeah. But what's so cool about cards, and you know, you probably know this again because you advise families, um, is all it is is a it creates a boundary around a conversation. Mm. So, like you were saying before about having a partial mediator. Well, I actually think people are probably spending years in couples therapy when all they really need to know is who's taking out the freaking garbage. Um, I know that that happened to us. Like, I realized that Seth and I really never even, we didn't really need all that extra, you know? I feel like we could have saved ourselves a lot of money because really all it was was just, we were lacking a system in the home and it was making us both insane in terms of decision fatigue. So mm -hmm. anyway, so, but of course, obviously mental health therapy is not, a, is a great thing. But for this, the boundary around a conversation. So, so I'll give you this, I never talked about this, but the history of the cards. So about um, a decade ago, I joined this uh, mediation group that, you know, there's not that many of us, you, you, you're a CFP, so you get it, but there's not many philanthropic advisors in this country. So I was in this mediation group and um, Charles Bronkman, actually, the philanthropist had started it. And I got to be a beta tester for this idea of legacy cards. So basically mm. you think about a yeah. patriarch, so I would go in and be hired by the family office and come in and speak to the patriarch of a family and say, I'm here, you know, we're going to be talking a lot about, you know, over the course of this engagement about your family plan, about your succession, take over your business and your philanthropy, how you get your kids involved. Well, what happens, Galen, if someone says to you, they're not going to die? Well, that sort of ends the conversation, right? So I had so many patriarchs say to me, well, I'm not going to die, so I'm not sure why we're having this conversation. So if you think you're <laughs> not going to die, then what's the need for succession? Obviously, you don't need it because you're going to live forever. So instead of asking pointed questions, which were getting me weird responses like I'm not going to die, very defensive responses, I started using cards and saying things to these patriarchs like, well, ha let's picture your legacy. Let's use these cards. Does your legacy look like the stars? Does it look like a newspaper? Does it look like... It was this card deck of all these images. 
And then one day, this one patriarch said to me, Oh, let's talk about that newspaper. Actually, my first dollar I ever made was through a newspaper route. And it was because my father really, you know, encouraged me at seven to get on my bike and start making money. And I became obsessed with media. And that's how I earned, owned my first newspaper. And so all of a sudden, all these men who were very closed mouth were opening up to me. And I started to see a decade mm. ago the beauty of gamification of cards. It's just like you said, impartial mediation where you can use a tool to open up conversations that are actually very difficult to have otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you use the term gamification um, because that's something that, I mean, I've been studying a lot about human behavior and psychology over the last little bit. And the more things can get gamified, the more fun it becomes and the more likely people are to stick through things. And there's a lot of research going on right now uh, in a lot of different fields. And so I'm glad you shared the origin of it. And um, a question I did have around, so in your own case, so you saw, this, you saw this mediation technique that ended up working really well, and then you decided to apply it to your household. Is that how it came about? Exactly. So I started just like everybody else, every other frustrated wife um, in hetero cisgender relationships. I started with a list. Again, then I started with a crazy list that you read about in Fair Play, but my list ended up being an Excel spreadsheet because I love, I love Excel and I love spreadsheets. But um, I created <laughs> something called the Should I Do Spreadsheet, which was a 98 tab spreadsheet that had been crowdsourced for nine months. And it had over a thousand items of invisible work on it. Ultimately, those became, you know, much more uh, easily to digest in the cards. But um, that Should I Do Spreadsheet, one day I decided after nine months of crowdsourcing to send the 19 million megabyte spreadsheet off to my husband, Seth, with um, a lot of the communication techniques I learned from my work, L literally no context, just can't wait to discuss. Um, and as you can imagine, um, <laughs> it didn't go over too well. I just got that one sad monkey emoji, you know, the one that's covering its eyes. I didn't even get the courtesy of the three monkey trio, just that sad monkey. And I think that day after being so excited to send the spreadsheet to Seth and having worked nine months on this should I do spreadsheet and getting just one emoji back, I realized that um, lists alone don't work, mm. especially for men. I mean, I spoke to so many men. Fair Play became a love letter to men who were like, I, I, it's not sexy for my wife to be in charge. I can't do anything right. I'm always being berated. Mm. I, I'm, you know, I'm a minion in my own home. I don't have any authority. It's, it was really, it's really sucked. And I think that it's this, you know, if you give someone a list, context, not control. So if you give context, not control, that's really the setup for a successful organization. So what happens in our home when our most important organization, one party, the man in this party is getting control, but no context. Well, that's mm. called nagging. I call it the rat fuck, the random assignment of a task fuck. And I think it's unfair <laughs> to you guys. So, mm. I, I'm trying, so my mission in life is to eliminate the rat fuck. And the only way you can get eliminate the random assignment of a task is by giving the other partner ownership of yes. the whole thing. Absolutely. And there was one thing, so it was really funny in the, in the, in the chat, chat we had last week, you, you mentioned this and it's something that I related to in the book, which it was, I would do more around the house if I felt like I was doing it right. Um, right. And so I was a stay at home dad for a couple of years. And so when Emma first started reading the book, I was like, well, I was a stay at home dad for a few years. Like, you know, I, I have a different context than a lot of guys, but it's funny because when I was a stay at home dad, things more or less in the household like I was the one who was like, okay, this is, this is the meal. This is the shopping. This is the, the, the way we load dishes, you know, that sort of thing. But then when I went back to work, um, it didn't, it's not like we divided it evenly. Like a lot of it went back to Emma and it was funny because all of a sudden it went from, I'm the one who knows how to load the dishwasher the right way to she knows how to load the dishwasher the right way because she had control of that. You know, she had, she was like, um, you know, um, she was the one who was in control of that, that item. And um, what in, another thing in the book that really helped a lot for us was um, minimum standard of care, which was like you verbally say, like, what are you willing, like, is it okay if the kids have um, mac and cheese, you know, once a week? Is it okay if this is dirt, how dirty it gets? In our case, I'll use the dishes as an example. Um, my tolerance 
of a stack of dishes is much higher than Emma's tolerance of a right. stack of dishes. And so she said, look, as long as it's clean, by the time I need to do a meal, we're good. Because I was letting it get to like the maximum capacity because I just wanted to do it once and get done with it. And she's like, no, like I need it ready every meal. So then it was, or every meal that she was cooking. And so I was like, okay, now I know what she's expecting. And so it makes it easier for me to say, okay, I know I need to do this. I know I need to do that. Um, rather than just not knowing what's that limit. It was more of a thing where by the time, by the time I noticed it, it was too late. <laughs> right. Well, that's it, right? It's just it, the minimum standard of care literally changed everything in our house. It really, I, I like to joke, um, you know, that Seth, if I ask him for an aspirin in the moment, he would let me die of a heart attack. But if we, if the minimum standard of care was that he had to bring me an aspirin every single morning at 8 a.m., right. the aspirin would show up. Seth mm. might be a good guy. It's just this idea of being nagged, you know, the garbage has to go out now when he's like, no, it doesn't, right? I mean, it's really mm. not that it's an emergency. It's really just about our value system and sort of what right. our tolerance is for things. So the beauty of the law, right, being trained as a lawyer was understanding that, that a trillion dollar tort system, our entire civil court system is based on a minimum standard of care. And so I kept mm. thinking that if this is how things are litigated everywhere, and it's, it's worked since England, since the 1600s, um, or at least Henry VIII, <laughs> this idea of a reasonable person standard, a tort standard, um, a minimum standard of care, and why wouldn't it work for our homes? And it just requires investing in conversations a little differently. And as you saw in the book, it started for us with garbage. Because yeah. I, but what I realized, Galen, something really important about fair play was that once I started understanding ownership, Seth really understood ownership, right? If you're going to, mm -hmm. look, these, this is a card we burn, but assume, say you play thank you notes, right? You actually care about this and you play it, right? The idea is that if you own it, right, you're owning it from writing the note to putting it in the envelope, to putting the stamp on and putting it into the mail. Um, but this idea of full ownership, Seth understood. But when it came to getting to a minimum standard of care, what I realized was I was ignoring the 10 years and more now, right at the time, it was 10 years of values-based mediation I was doing for families. Mm. So how did I get to a, a joint a system where people could buy in? Well, it was through your why. Mm. And so I think when you miss, skip that step, I started to see with couples that fair play wasn't working. If you just go to divvying up the cards, Fair play wasn't working because you had to take that step back and establish your minimum standard of care for each card that was tricky for your family. And how do you do that? Well, you talk about your why. So mm -hmm. in terms of garbage, right, sitting down with Seth, even for 10 minutes and saying to him, okay, I'm triggered by garbage. Um, you probably have learned this in couples therapy, but we're doing this now through this game, right? I'm triggered because I lived in a small apartment in the Lower East Side of Manhattan where we had a cockroach and water bowl problem because my mother was a single mom and she never got a garbage can. She just never invested in a garbage can. We would have a, a, paper, a plastic bag that was on a knob. It would fall out all over the floor. Our floor was sticky. Um, and Seth, when I see garbage, even a banana peel out of the side, this corner of my eye, I, I'm seven years old again. Mm. And I'm the one who's helping my mother with her eviction notices and waiting for my father to show up and he never did. So I don't want to relitigate re that time in my life. I've grown past that. And getting a clean trash can helps me signify that I'm in a different part of my life. And I think then Seth was able to say to me, well, I never even thought about garbage. I've had a housekeeper my whole life. And um, in my fraternity, I slept on Domino's pizza boxes. <laughs> I didn't have a pillow, I don't think. I think I just slept on empty pizza boxes. So I don't give a shit about garbage. So Galen, as you said, what happens if you have different values over something that has to get done every day? Well, 30% yes. of marriages end over this shit. Yeah. It's, it's unfair and it's crazy. So I think getting to that minimum standard of care is so important. But you only get to that minimum standard of care if you are willing to, to invest in your why. And I had to well, be vulnerable and explain to Seth about being seven years old and being a product of a single mom and not wanting to see cockroaches and water bugs all over my floor. And then Seth, when he said, well, I don't care about garbage, what he did say was, I know you care about garbage. And so when I own it, mm. the bag will go back in the bin 
And yes, it'll go out once a day. But you can't ask me to take it out every hour. All right. <laughs> well, I, so I love that story because, I mean, like so many things you just said. So really going from lists as of themselves just really don't work and digging deeper into that why. And I think that was another thing in the book that really hit me was, so the two big things that hit me, one was um, I did not, I didn't, I didn't voice this. I never said it. And it wasn't until I read the book that it hit me really hard that I was living this way was that I did not believe that all time was created equal. Like I did believe that my wife, like, oh, she's, she's better at this stuff. She's faster at this stuff. She knows the way it should be done. Um, she's, she's not working full time anymore. Like I am, like, I just felt like, oh, she should spend time doing this. I never verbalized it. And so reading it in the book really made me confront that thought. And the other thing was the thought that, well, she just cares about stuff that isn't important. And okay. that also hit me when I read the book, because that's what I was saying in my head was, well, she cares about this thing that I don't care about. So why should I have to do, right. like, why should I have to make sure there's a salad with every meal when I'm okay eating sandwiches literally every meal? Right. Ever? <laughs> and me too, and, by the way. Me yeah. Too. <laughs> the sandwiches or the... <laughs> yeah, no, me too. Me, you and I would have had a very different minimum standard of care together, right? Maybe our kids would be like, have diabetes at like 25. Right. <laughs> but you know, again, it depends on what your values alignment is. But I love and that then you that, recognize yeah. that. I love that you recognize well, this idea that all time is created equal. It does not mean that all tasks will be divided equal. It right. does not mean that the deck has to be 50-50. And I actually think 50-50 has held back women for a decade, I mean, mm. not a decade, for a hundred years. Because mm -hmm. what does that even mean? And a lot of times, you know, there is a, you know, somebody who's more of a primary breadwinner and, you know, it's, that's changing over time. But over the past 30, 40 years, typically men have um, been in a more primary breadwinner type role that is changing. So definitely it will come more to 50, 50, but it's this idea that this is unpaid labor. And yeah, all, all it was, as I said to Seth was, look, I did choose philanthropy. You chose private equity. Yes. Your hours are paid more than mine. But mm. That doesn't mean that every, second of un unpaid labor should default to me because I see that you still have four hours to check sports center, you know, <laughs> to check your fantasy scores, to you know, finish your PowerPoint deck to work out. But you're expecting me to spend my last 12 minutes in service of our family, whether it's washing the dishes, putting an extra load of laundry in. And that was, a, was unfair. It doesn't mean I won't hold more cards, but it was a recognition that I only have 24 hours in my day too. Yes. And so I should deserve a little time choice over how I use that time. That was that. And when Seth and I finally understood that it was about time choice, that I had so mm -hmm. much less time choice over my day. Mm -hmm. my day right. He was like, that sucks. Yeah. Well, and I definitely, so there's two things I definitely want to make sure we talk about. One is unicorn space. And uh, cause that's something in the book I found very fascinating, but still have some questions about. And then also tips for uh, times when there is a spouse, like, I work with a lot of medical professionals and sometimes it's two doctors married to each other, but sometimes it is a doctor and then a spouse that maybe has a less demanding or less um, volatile schedule. And so I was wondering um, what tips you have for that. Cause you're saying, you know, 50, 50, um, like you're saying, it doesn't necessarily mean a 50% division of the tasks, but let's say there is like an ER doc who works crazy hours or a shift worker even who works crazy hours and, they're married to someone who has maybe a more regular schedule. Like, is there a way to, to help? Uh, I mean, I assume a lot of it's having the conversation, but I'm wondering if there's a tip or two to, to, in that type of relationship. Absolutely. Um, let's start with that because I think so many people are in this situation now where there's one partner who still has to go outside the home and the other partner just by default or she falls is, um, <laughs> is, you know, left with a lot of the unpaid labor of the day, including home and their kids and trying to keep their job. Um, and so it's, it's a really messed up dynamic right now. And so all that you can do right now is recognize that every day is a new day. And it's the practice, Galen, it's the practice of understanding what your family ecosystem is. So there will mm. be times where you may hold all of the cards. But if you understand that it's not a life sentence, and mm. that the expectation wasn't that and so let me explain the difference. A tooth fairy example. And I haven't told this example, but I want to remember to tell it because I think it's a good one. So this is a difference between one family pre and post fair play. So pre fair play, I had a couple who dad was home while mom was on a business trip. 
Um, the wow. expectation, right, because it wasn't communicated, was that mom is in charge of everything, right, the conception and planning of the home. So when their daughter lost her tooth, um, she was hysterically crying because the tooth fairy didn't come. Now, in that situation, the husband, who was home with the child, blamed the wife because she didn't remind him. Now, remember, she's in a conference room in a Hong Kong. So that expectation, right, that it would default on her, led to this giant, almost like, I'm going to end my marriage fight. Cut to later on in the same marriage. And I love that somebody named Mrs. Tooth joined, right, as we're talking about <laughs> Just in time. Yeah. Um, so then so that's the tooth fairy before, the expectation, where she's in a meeting room in Hong Kong. Her husband says, well, the tooth fairy didn't come because you didn't remind me. Okay. To cut to later, fair playing now, where they had a similar tooth fairy incident again. And what they told me was that dad was holding magical beings. He held the card, right? Mm. And mom was traveling or somewhere. And this time, actually, tooth fairy didn't come again. Mm. Um, tooth fairy did not come again. And t dad totally owned it. It was a totally, she said it was a totally different dynamic. Tooth fairy didn't come, you know, things are crazy. He's home, she's away, the dynamic, he's, you know, whatever. T things fall through the cracks again. And so this time, though, dad tells me it was my mistake, my fault, because I owned the mm. card at the time. Doesn't mean I'll own it forever, but I wasn't blaming you for not reminding me. It was my card. Tooth fairy didn't come. So what dad and mom said, I'm going to let him correct his mistake instead of trying to solve it and safer it and yell at him and make it break us and tell the kids, oh my God, the tooth fairy, and make it a total giant disaster. She just said, you know what? Tooth fairy didn't come. You correct your mistake. Follow through. It's your ownership. So sure. dad tells me, he emails toothfairy at gmail.com. <laughs> Apparently, she responds. There's an amazing human being who responds to this email. Um, so if anybody needs it. And basically, what she responded back was, sorry, you didn't get your tooth. I'm on a backlog. Things are really busy <laughs> right now. And I come, I'll come tonight and you get double the money. And that kid was super happy and the tooth fairy came that night. But I'm watching that dynamic of a couple who didn't know who owned what before, where it's a blame game, almost destroying yes. their marriage, to after, my bad, tooth fairy didn't come, I'm gonna own my mistake. That's fair play in a nutshell. And so mm. all it means is that when you're owning it, you own it, but it's not a life sentence. It's not a life sentence. So for the first responders, all I'm going to say is to the people who are home, your life's going to suck right now. It sucks to try to homeschool and be a parent and try to watch your kids and work. It's just impossible, especially if you have a first responder or doctors outside the home, but it's not a life sentence. And you just got to commit to the practice of communicating. Even if you're yes. sitting down every night for 15 minutes and you still say, well, I'm holding all the cards, at least you're going through and saying, let me just tell you what's happening tomorrow with the kids. Just so you know, mm. you know um, doesn't mean you have to do anything, but you know, the, the schedule's changing. Like I'm in charge of homeschool this week. I had a panic attack because our school is not doing it so well. And there's 10, <laughs> 20 minute meetings like 17 times a day. And so I mm. just said to Seth, I said, I, it's, it's on me this week. I'm not yelling at you or I'm not pissed at you because you're not doing it because I'm owning homeschool this week, the scheduling of it. But I'm just telling you that I'm sort of, I can't sleep. I'm having some insomnia because it sucks. And all Seth said to me was in our nightly check-in was like, it totally sucks. Yeah. That's, and I just needed that validation. <laughs> like I'll own yeah. it this week, but it totally sucks. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, yep, <laughs> your head sure does. <laughs> and he'll take it over next week. He's going to take it over because mm -hmm. it's a busy week this week. And so I'm sort of supervising it. He's still doing his hour PE and, and math with our kids, but mm -hmm. sort of scheduling it all, the calendar keeper function card, it's sort of on me this week to figure out all these different puzzle pieces. Yeah. Yeah. And then that check-in certainly at this time has been valuable for us that we've been checking in way more than normal to be like, all right, and scheduling and I mean, just so many things. Um, so one of the questions I got, and I don't remember if you share, if ever, I don't know if I've, you've ever shared this before, but one of the questions I got when I said, what should I ask Eve Rodsky? They said, um, ask her what her unicorn space is. 
And so Emma and I, like, it's one part of the book where when we were going to be on the chat last week, I was like, I don't know if we deserve to be on this chat because neither of us has figured out this whole unicorn space thing. And one of your assistants, I think Jen, said, don't worry, like, I'm still figuring it out. You're still figuring it out. So, I mean, maybe to talk about that, uh, it, 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 what that is and how to figure out, maybe how to, I think figuring it out is probably a big thing for people because they've never Absolutely. taken the time. That's, I, I feel like when we cast you for the documentary, I, that's what I want to really focus, hone in on because I'm so happy you said that. The fact that you recognize what, that it was something and you're willing mm. to try to figure it out for both of you is an investment in your marriage. Because like I say, the permission to be unavailable when mm. you're dating, it's like such a cool thing, right? To get that text, like that cortisol when that text comes in from the person you like and they're, you know, you're waiting for them to call. And now we're like so available, right? I mean, it, we, the quarantine <laughs> could make us more available. Like I can't go a second without seeing Seth's like shadow in my space, you know? And so I think there's a lot of destructive ways to become unavailable, like mm, drugs yeah. and alcohol and finding your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend on Facebook. So, you know, a lot of people have been willing to be honest and vulnerable to admit. Um, uh, or you can find your unicorn space, which is um, this idea of passion and purpose and all that. It's such bullshit to me without domestic rebalance. But once you get more efficiency in your home, then, you know, hopefully what you can do with that time, instead of making it, again, destructive, mm. making it really productive. And all it is, is, are you curious about something? And mm. were you ever curious about something? And how do you actively pursue that? Even if it's five minutes mm. away. And so the beauty of that is like this idea of finding your passion and purpose. It sounds like it has been lost. Like, I don't yeah. want to find that. I'm never going to find my love of the gender division of labor. Um, I didn't, <laughs> I'm going to find my love of writing. I didn't know that that was my unicorn space, but I became very curious about this topic of why women do more in the home. And then I started mm. reading article after article after article. And then eight years later, you know, I had this, a book. Um, so I think that's what I like to say about, about unicorn space is that we know it's tied to longevity, this idea of having mm. an active pursuit that you share with the world. It's tied with your mental health and your longevity. A lot of people have been bread making. Maybe it's bread making. But the other problem I find, especially maybe for you and me, Galen, people who are more like in the financial sector, I'm a lawyer, you're, um, you know, you work with, um, high, you know, high net worth people and you help them shape their, their finances is that um, that's creative, but no one's ever yeah. defined it as creative for us. Like the strategies you employ with your clients, um, being a lawyer and trying to figure out a family system for how people communicate, those are creative. So what I want to say is unicorn space, like the mythical equine, doesn't fucking exist unless you reclaim it. But it doesn't mean you have to just become a Bob Ross painter. <laughs> because I'm left brained. I'm never going to paint. But mm. it's just about what mm. you're curious about. And then how do you actively pursue that? Because what that does for your partner is it makes you sexier to both of you. Yes. Because it gives you a, a way to be unavailable. Because sometimes when I'm thinking about book two and I have an idea, I'm in my head and my kids and Seth are like, you're not here with us right now. And I'm like, you're right, I'm not here with you right now. I'm thinking of an idea for a chapter. That unavailability actually is really, is really important. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So my and unicorn space is the gender division of labor. Um, but, uh, but more than that, it's um, hip hop dance. It's what I used to do um, since I was a kid. My feet are broken and messed up because of it. Oh. But I've been taking like Debbie Allen dance classes on, um, on Zoom for the, whatever, on Instagram, whatever, Facebook, whatever platform, I can't remember. Um, so I've been trying to get back into a rhythm. And my kids are so embarrassed when they see me like trying to choreograph something to drink or that, to, that means you're doing it right. <laughs> I well, busted out a dance, a, a choreographed dance I did to Naughty by Nature from the nineties. They were they were just horrified. Oh yeah. Naughty by nature. Yep, yep. <laughs> well um okay, very cool. So part of it is figuring out what's what's what you're curious about. Um to like okay, so part of my so I, I wrote a productivity journal and part of it Come, one of the things that comes with the productivity journal is figuring out your superpower. Because about a year and a half ago, two years ago, someone introduced me to the idea of superpowers, and I had kind of not really thought about it. 
But then the more time I spent interviewing people about it, I have all sorts of episodes on interviewing people about their superpower and helping people discover theirs. Um, curiosity is definitely a huge part of it. And like, so one of the, so I think, so the first question I think you said was like, what have you been curious about? What gets you to that point where you are kind of spaced out, like lost in thought? Um, another question I ask people is like, what makes time stand still for you? Uh, what, can, what can you get lost in doing for hours on end? Um, because for me, and it's interesting what you said about longevity is um, for me, I feel like a life is more fully lived when someone knows what their superpower is and lives into it. And I feel like a unicorn space is like a very yeah. solid tie into that is to like how to find the time to do that. The space to do it. Exactly. Within the space, yeah. the best degree balance. I think your podcast is your unicorn space, right? I mean, at least it has to be one of them for you because what yeah. you're doing, Galen, is you're bringing ideas and you're coaching people through whether it's their superpower. But I think the beauty of you bringing new ideas to the table um, and the way you interview and you're very thoughtful and, and bringing those ideas out, right? That's creative. Um, and so I yeah. think like that, and it's important to do. And that's what I've been saying to a lot of people, right? It doesn't have to be paid or it doesn't have to be your like mm. number one thing, right? I mean, we right. All, I, I still kept my job as a family mediator and a philanthropic advisor and a lawyer. I still keep my job through fair play because um, it's good to make money. But you, <laughs> but it, but and a lot of people, you know, it, some people who are privileged get their unicorn space as their job. I think some right. people have that privilege and. It's usually more high net worth people, right? Like a Seth MacFarlane who gets to make TV <laughs> for a living or whatever, right? But, yeah, yeah. you know, most of us actually have a day job that we like, we may be fulfilled by, but it's not necessarily our unicorn space. And, and the one other thing I'll say for women is a lot of women were fighting back saying it's soul cycle for me. And I'd say that's mm. self care. It's great to participate in a class is great. And that is self care and it's important. But I'm talking about the active pursuit. How do you know, not reading that book, which is my self care, but writing that book, not um, eating the mm. pie, which is another piece of self care for me. I love sugar. I love sweets. Um, this quarantine's not good for me for that reason, but it's baking that pie. If for mm. you not listening to a podcast, it's picking up the freaking phone and asking people to be on your podcast and to coordinate it and to produce it. That's the difference. That's the active pursuit I'm talking about. Yeah, I get it. I get it. And I mean, one of the things is Emma, when she read the book, she was like, I have no idea what my unicorn space is. And I was like, we got to figure it out. And I think one of the things that's difficult to, to claim that space is partially because um, it almost it feels selfish. And especially like, I mean, I do triathlons every year and it takes me, you know, it, it, I have to go and run and bike and swim. And, you know, uh, I mean, right now, not so much, but like in general, it's usually like an hour a day and that sort of thing. But it is difficult because it's like, this is time away from my family. It's kind of like you're saying when dating, it's like that time together was so finite and precious. It's like, oh, this is like the best thing in the world. And now it's like, we are hyper available. <laughs> it's almost like, oh, exactly. this is not I, what I, yeah. Yes, how you signed up for. I, I look at all the men in the playground with their wives, we're literally they're following them around. And I just look at them, I'm like, you shouldn't be here right now. Mm. You should be out doing your run or doing what you want to do. And then you take your kid later. They yeah. always spend way too much time together. Yeah. We spend way too much time together. Obviously, we have to in this quarantine. But, and I don't mean way too much time together, maybe in that connective way. I mean, like, running to each other to a park, to sitting in the stands of your kids' extracurricular game. You don't always have to do shit together. Stop going to Costco together. Anytime I see a couple in Costco together, I'm like, well, I, I started to, about four years ago, I started to just ask people if they were willing to answer my questions. Do they want to be there together? How did they get there together? Is this their fun time? And I, you know, people were looking at me like I was crazy, but they just assume they have to go to Costco together. Yeah. No, I'd rather you get your, your, your triathlon training in, in the, on Saturday morning, and then Emma can go do whatever she does in the afternoon, right? Just figure it out. Maybe she needs to take a walk to start thinking about what she's curious about. But giving yeah. her that time, the only issue is when it's really imbalanced, and that's what I've talked about. Fair play is so not scorekeeping. It's the opposite of scorekeeping, as we know. Right. It's about ownership. I don't give a shit how many, who holds what cards, as long as you're doing it with full CPE, conception, planning, and execution. But in terms of unicorn space, there does have to be some fairness because that's where there's a lot of resentment. The resentment in my research came when I asked people, what do you resent most about their spouse? Your spouse. Ironically, mm. Galen, it was the thing that their spouse loved most to do. 
So that's a terrible midlife crisis to be living with someone who hates you for doing the things that fulfill you. But I wow. realize why now. It's because it was an imbalance. Yeah. So if one person was taking it, the other person wasn't. So this one man was really angry at his wife because she did musical theater. And I get it. Musical theater is hard. It was, she does this like, community theater. She has to go three nights a week for rehearsal. He has to put the kids to bed. But it's because he didn't have unicorn space. Right. So it's about the fairness. It's like, if you're going to mm. train for that triathlete, triathlon, then you say to Emma, I want to give you that time back. Absolutely. That's and I have, really what it I, have, is. I have good news for you, Eve. After we read your book, we spend less time together. <laughs> but just what you mean, like that bland kind of blah, like, because we, we both work at home, we're both self-employed, so it was like we'd both take the kids to school because, you know, she didn't want to go alone or I didn't want to go alone. Like, and it was just kind of like this sort of like default existence of, sure, we're both going to do all these things together, and both of us have less time than before to do what we really need to be doing or really want to be doing. And so now, uh, you know, it was, I wasn't going with, to do the grocery shopping, but I was the one taking the kids every day. And the kids just knew it. When they didn't knew it, they would fight over it. Like, no, I want mom to do it. No, I want dad to do it. And I'm like, you know who's doing it on Mondays, I'm Thursdays, crying. and Fridays? I'm crying. <laughs> if there's anything, anybody who can go from a rainbow arc for me, it's this, it's, it's the efficiency arc. So what you just mm. said makes me want to cry because this both trap of us all both having to do everything is the most inefficient. Un and so to me as an organizational management specialist, I have like a panic attack when I see the double up or this idea of the breakup, right? Where I'm thinking about dinner. I had this one publisher who fought for the book. And so it was down to three of them. And then she comes to me to tell me about she's been playing fair play. Um, I said, great. And she's like, yeah, so my husband's making dinner every night and here's the menu I selected for him. So mm. I said, okay, you know what? You're not getting the book <laughs> because if she was going to be my editor and didn't understand that mm. you don't select the menu, that when you hand over the dinner card, that person chooses the menu, then I said, she's not the right person to, to, to edit this book. And so, you know, the other two got it in a better way, but that's it. That efficiency. It's so and good. I think, so yeah, and I think what happens, I mean, like, and I think it's a thing of like, my sense is it's a modern couple kind of thing. Like, back in the day, it was like, it was imbalanced, because it was, yeah, the guy's gonna stay at home and like, smoke his pipe or whatever, and the wife's gonna do all this stuff. And modern day, I feel like it's like, people know that that's not the way it should be, right. but they're not 100% sure what to do instead. And so it's like, since we don't know what to do, we're both going to go to the park every yes. time. We're both going to go shopping every time. We're both going to do everything all the time because we're trying to go, we're trying to go in the opposite direction, but without the guidance of something like fair play in the card system, it just, it just, it doesn't, it still doesn't work. Like we were still annoyed by the I fact that miserable. like, I, when I'm in the park with you, I'm miserable. <laughs> I'm like, why are we here together? Why I never want to be around with my husband ever, ever in our entire life. It's literally, it's like, it's worse than, being stabbed in the eye with a... <laughs> well, and, but everyone's bag. just on their exactly. phones anyway. <laughs> I actually, I've been stabbed in the eye with a gummy bear bag, and I'm telling you, going to the, pl the playground with my partner is worse. It's right up there. It's right up there. Gummy bear bag. There's just, we get no time back. We both come back exhausted. There's no rejuvenation time. It's completely inefficient. And your kids don't need you there. They're there to be with their friends or to learn a new skill. And yep. so, again, it's this idea of, quality time and i and i don't mean yes. that in these platitudes i really do mean that that seth and i spend so much less time together but we still yes. are we're but we're so much more happy in that time and our kids get to watch those those interactions and yeah. we're modeling something for them right we're modeling Absolutely. that mom and dad can do each thing that you know nothing defaults to women that it's okay to cry it's okay Bye. to be honest you know a lot of things talk about toxic masculinity and men being okay to cry but actually i actually think it's harder to say to my son it's okay for you to cry because it's so random but when i started mm. saying to my son ben it's okay for you to fold laundry and here's how you're gonna fold with me um mm. there's a lot of femininity in that because of the, they're still hearing all those toxic gender roles and so when they get the permission to fold it's almost like they're also getting the permission to cry and to be a different type of of man, a one that they don't see so much in, in, in pop. Yeah. Pop. yeah. Well, one of the things I say to my kids is like, I say it's, it's good to cry when you need to. 
um, like it's good because I know like growing up it's like oh it's okay to do these things I'm like well okay is kind of like man <laughs> like it's good like it's when you need to it's a good thing to do to that. get that out there and that um, yeah yeah okay and it yeah. it's good to cry yeah it's good it's like if you got to do it you got to do it like it's good to get it out there because um, bottling it up uh, does not work <laughs> yeah and I think that that's that's the last thing I'll say you know to your listeners is that um, I want to talk about communication and just end on this. I think it's really important to understand communication because there are so many men and women, Galen, that said things to me like, I, we can't communicate about domestic life. It's too triggering. Mm. And so you know this from fair play, but you're, you know, your watchers may not, but that so many people would say that to me. So, okay, I'm a mediator. I just listen. I was just taking notes. A woman says this to me. I can't communicate about domestic life with my partner. It's just too triggering. Well, I feel bad for him that she thinks that, but okay, so she says that to me. And then 20 minutes later in our interview, I'm writing down about the time that she tells me that she dumped wet clothes on her husband's pillow when he forgot to put them in the dryer. Mm. Then I talked to another woman who said she doesn't communicate about domestic life. And she said to me that she won't talk to her husband about domestic life, but that I find out later that she has an Instagram account called the shit my husband doesn't pick up. And she takes pictures of everything that he leaves all over the floor and, and the, the dishes in the sink. So what mm. I want to say to your viewers is that you are already communicating about domestic life. You are already communicating. So once I started to ask couples for a conversation shift and not a start, I got a lot more um, beta testers and players for fair play. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. It was the, the communication was there. It just wasn't like, let's sit down and talk about this. It's let me dump wet laundry on your pillow. Let me have an Instagram account about what a jerk. You are. It's there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh man. That's amazing. About domestic life, but it's this idea that, you know, we, we, we think of communication as like, we need to talk. Right. And so if you think about it that way, it could be a little scary. So I like to say it's like a practice, just like exercise, it's just a practice. It's not going to always go well. Like I don't always, when I work out, sometimes I get on, you know, treadmill and I'm just like, I don't want to be here. And then I get off in one minute, but at least I, <laughs> I did 60 seconds. It's better than nothing. Yeah. A practice yeah, yeah. is, um, you know, practice makes perfect, not perfect, but you know, practice makes better. And I think this idea of, you know, when you are so, when you never, if you never communicate or you're doing it in passive aggressive ways, like yeah. dumping wet clothes in your husband's pillow, then you don't have a practice of how to come to the table to even start a conversation. Right. So that's, again, what the gamification does. It allows you to come with um, a mediation tool that says we're going to have a third party to, and there'll be this game, the game to sort of make us, force us, you know, in a fun way to have, you know, conversations we should be having. Who gets the gifts for Christmas? Who wants to do that this year? You know, just everyday conversations and you start practicing. So the communication shift is a really important thing to understand because it's, um, it all starts there. It all starts with how we communicate it. And that can sound trite, but it is, it really unfortunately is the only way forward. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's just so many people don't know where to start. And like you said, like we need to talk doesn't go over usually all that great, but no, read this book. Let's play with these cards. Right. Let's lay the cards out. Very different conversation. Yeah. Let's, um, let's, very different. Um, you know, let's take a hit of THC and just talk for 10 minutes. Let's, you know, <laughs> let's down a tequila shot and sit together. <laughs> let's bake, you know, let's eat a full Ben and Jerry's pint of ice cream and just talk about tomorrow. Like you can, like my favorite economist, Dan Ariely, who is a, he was a consultant for the book. I mean, he wrote, I mean, he, did a lot of interviews for me for the chapters. And he has his own um, great book called Predictably Irrational. He's a columnist for the Wall Street Journal. Um, he talks a lot about short-term reward substitution. Mm. So he's like, when you gamify, that is already a short-term reward substitution because there's a game involved. But he said, have a prize. Mm. What's your prize for your game? Is it, again, sitting down afterwards to a good dinner? Is it watching your favorite show after? Is it right. sex? Whatever it is, they're, they're, the idea of some sort of prize, um, a short-term reward, uh, is, makes you more willing to come back to the table. Very cool. Yeah, I know that, that makes tons of sense. Set that up, the prize system. Very cool. Well, Eve, thank you so much for joining me. So I wanted to make sure everyone has a few things before they go. One is 
Um, if you're not already following Eve, be sure to follow Eve at Eve Rodsky uh, sorry, at Eve Rodsky, the Instagram handle and uh, at your website, people can go in. Uh, so fairplaylife.com, buy a copy of the book. You can also sign up to get exclusive essays uh, from you, giveaways and other things and to download the cards. Like you said, the cards alone aren't going to do the deal, but it's a great way place to find them, but then also buy the book and read it. And then um, also I've put together a link just for people who have seen this. So for my own productivity journal, uh, the squirrel journal.com slash Eve uh, for anyone who's watching this. And I will be sure to, I will definitely, if nothing else, take the um, unicorn space part of the conversation and definitely make sure that there's a, uh, that you end up, I'll email you all the links and the transcription of that part, because it's definitely um, top of mind for me. Um, anything else? Yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you for being in your unicorn space today and for <laughs> uh, bringing your specific lens to this conversation because um, uh, I think the fact that you are already open to new ideas and that mm. you've been doing this for a while probably also makes you as a man less close to listening to new ideas. And I think that's the beauty of why when you reached out, I really liked you and your wife so much because it's this idea of, you know, you're willing to listen and you're very calm about it. And uh, that's all it is. It's this idea that um, nobody is telling you how to live your life, but it's about consciousness. And when you can raise consciousness and not be defensive and then employ some tools to make your life better, then we're all better, including the next generation. So that's what I'll just leave with. Thank Amazing. you. You're a unicorn space. Thank you. And thank you for everything. Thank you for joining me. And I really appreciate it. Well, we'll see you again in the documentary. We'll be casting. Yeah, we'll talk soon. All right. Bye. <laughs> Bye.